streaming live via the internet, welcome to ISP Radio, your weekly source for ISP-related news, events, and interviews with industry experts. If you deliver internet via fiber optic, fixed wireless, coax, or any other way, you're in the right place. And now a brief word from our sponsors. Link Technologies Incorporated provides the lowest priced Microtech products in North America, as well as Wade Towers, Mimosa, Cambium, Ubiquity, Nettonics, and a host of other products and services to be your one-stop shop for your ISP needs. Visit www.linktext.net. That's L-I-N-K-T-E-C-H-S dot net for more information. TowerCoverage.com, providing online RF coverage maps with website integration. Stop rolling your trucks for every site survey and start doing installations. Visit www.towercoverage.com now. And now we'd like to present our hosts, Steve Grabiel and Dennis Burgess. Another edition of ISP Radio. I'm your host, Steve Grabiel, broadcasting from beautiful, sunny New Mexico. Going to be a beautiful fall day here. Um, not much going on here other than just uh, enjoying the last dashes of summer here um, before we head into the colder fall. Um, was out plowing fiber in the ground yesterday, and fortunately I've called our 811 dig people and they spotted everything, but the water company can't spot their stuff because no contractor puts wire in the ground, but I was plowing along and hit the customer's water line, so I had to call the water company. They came over, shut off the water, and I dug out the hole, found the pipe, and put on my plumber pants and repaired it, then continued on, got the microduct I was throwing in the ground gun, but uh, that kind of uh, turned a half-hour job into a three-hour job. Yeah. But other than that, uh, everything's been running smoothly in my neck of the woods. Dennis, how's it working in your neck of the woods? Well, you know what? We've been real busy. Uh, we've been definitely doing some projects for some, uh, I'm not going to say high-profile customers, but they're definitely uh, you know uh, higher-profile customers, things like that. Getting them straightened out, straight uh, straightened out, and and everything uh, aligned correctly. Uh, doing uh, deployments with uh, Mimosa and Cambium, as well as Microtech, as well. Um, today we got uh, a couple good things. We have uh, Brad with Morningstar. We're going to talk to here in a little bit, uh, and then we also have uh, a number of extra shows uh, or new shows. Uh, looks like we have Bridge Wave uh, going to be on next week. Uh, as well, so really good stuff. You know, we've been keeping keeping busy, and uh, you know, we've been ordering uh, all new products as much as we can. You know, that's that's the name of the game. You know. Mhm. Mm so, uh, speaking of new products, uh, Microtech actually released their brand new wireless wi uh, wireless wire product. Now, this product is uh, on order. It is not available just yet. It's not uh, sitting there where we actually have. Uh, where we actually have them yet. Uh, however, these are the 60 gigahertz, uh, one gigabit full duplex radios. And what's happening with Microtech is they are going to have an initial batch that they actually want uh, to register deals with so that if you have uh, customers that need many more, they will get the priority on, on getting those. So we're trying to get as many customers to buy uh, one, two, to try them out uh, as possible so that we can get those uh, products in stock and we can get them shipped to the client as quickly as possible. Now, what's really cool about the wireless uh, wire product, and I'm going to put it up on the screen here. There it is. Uh, the wireless wire product, this product... Uh, is a pair of 60 gigahertz radios. So it's not just one, it's actually two. They're uh, actually what we call WAP 60s. And these products uh, will give you one gigabit full duplex uh, at several hundred meters. Uh, I believe they are basically stating that it's, it's about a uh, hundred plus meter range. It does drop down in speed. So if you have a longer link, it can uh, demodulate and drop down on speed. 100-meter uh, range is, is the full gigabit range. But the big thing is these things are $200 for a pair. Uh, they wow. come pre-configured. They, they basically, you, put, you plug them in. They should be connected uh, right away as long as they have signal. 
So really good stuff with Microtech uh, as far as this brand new product goes. 60 gigahertz, it's uh, licensed light. Uh, it's paired, secured, uh, can be powered by uh, DC power jack, AF, AT, or passive PoE. Really great product, and, and hopefully uh, in the end we will have uh, quite a bit of customers requesting that. Um, again, 198 is the, the set price. Uh, everything is already there. Uh, you have a built-in antenna. It actually has a phased array 60-degree beamforming antenna in it, uh, which is kind of new to Microtech, so we'll have to see how that all works out, uh, etc. Some other products that Microtech has recently announced, again, we don't have them, is we have the new FiberBox. Uh, this is a 5-port SFP uh, outdoor-rated box so that you can actually have five SFPs uh, coming into the fiber box and uh, going back out, and it is 79 bucks. Now, this, again, is an outdoor-rated enclosure so that you can put it up on a tower if necessary. Uh, Microtech also announced the 11, or I'm sorry, the RB1100AHX4. Now, this is not a new product. Um, they have the AHX4 Dude Edition, which actually has a 64 gig SSD drive in it. But now they actually have the AHX4 without the Dude Edition. Now, basically, that it does not have the hard drive in it, and they have a price uh, that is uh, fairly decent, 299 for the 1100 AHX4. So uh, you have that. The uh, AHX4 does have dual uh, DC, or I'm sorry, dual AC in, so dual power supplies, but it also has a uh, DC power jack. So I'm going to zoom in here. It does have a DC input jack as well uh, that you can actually power it with 48 volt or 24 volt or anything from. Uh, 12 to 56, uh, 57 volts. So really good stuff there as well. Uh, great new product for Microtech. They dropped the Dude Edition because a lot of people don't need the Dude. They, they just want a, uh, a multi-port router that actually has some decent uh, throughput. And they're saying uh, it's going to do about uh, 7 gig-ish or so of throughput. So it should be a, a really great... Uh, first off, it is passive-cooled. So that is kind of uh, important to note. Um, but because it is passive-cooled, it's probably one of those uh, tower box routers that you're going to do. Uh, and it's going to be bring it in line with the price point of a CCR. You know, CCR is about $349 uh, for the 10,009 9-core. Now you have a 4-core device at $299. Uh, we also have the MUPS. This was uh, a product announced at the last MUM. Uh, this is the... POE uh, in and out, and then you can hook up a battery to it. There's no management interface to this at all. Uh, it comes with a connector to connect a uh, battery on it. And uh, right now, there's no management interface. They are saying that they're going to make one. Um, but this uh, product is 29 bucks. Again, we're going to be getting those in as well. And then they also have their new uh, M11G, which is their new uh, CPE device. Uh, this one actually has a SIM slot and is really designed for a SIM card. Uh, we also have the 48-volt uh, power supply for the 1072s. Those are going to be coming out as well. So with that said, you know, Microtech has quite a few new products. This was in their last newsletter. It's all publicly available. Most of these products are not uh, have not hit the distributors yet. Uh, so in the next few months, they will probably hit... Uh, pretty quickly, and we'll go from there. But the big thing, the wireless wire, uh, wire, one gig full duplex, 100 to 200 meters, roughly, just say, uh, and for 200 bucks for a pair is relatively inexpensive. So absolutely, yeah, you know, I mean, the the overall product life of this. Uh, now they they did announce at the mum a uh, LHG 60 gigahertz. So this is a light head grid, uh, and it's based on their LHG design. Uh, I'm sure people have already seen those. Uh, I'll I'll pull one up just to, to just to give a picture to everybody. Um, but that is uh, has not even hit the distributor pricing point yet, so we haven't even got the uh, uh, LHG. If I can type, uh, we haven't even got any type of information. We can't even order them as of yet. Um, but it will be coming out. It will be coming out eventually. And uh, again, I'm gonna toss up what the LHG looks like on the screen 
there it is. They will have a 60 gigahertz version, which will give it a much larger antenna uh, to go a little bit further. Uh, again, when that is going to come out, I cannot sit there and tell you that because I don't know yet, but it will be coming out eventually. So there you go. Um, in other news, uh, we have a wonderful report uh, from a gentleman named Andrew Left. And he is the uh, managing editor at a company called Citron Research. And uh, I believe yesterday or the day before, uh, he actually posted on CitronResearch.com a, uh, I'm not going to say a warning, but he basically posted a video as well as some uh, a report that basically stated that Ubiquity has some characteristics of a fraudulent company. In other words, their books and their numbers are exaggerated and things are not as they should be. However, there are a number, I believe six or eight law firms in the U.S. that are representing uh, investors are investigating the accusation. There's nothing that says that this is actually occurring. There's nothing that says that this is uh, an actual fraud case. It is just a accusation. So with that said, you know, uh, as everybody will tell you, you need to do your own research on, on that if you wish to invest into said company. But this has actually caused uh, Ubiquity quite a bit of grief because uh, of the this video and what they basically say. And, and I got the, the Citron research here. Um, there's a number of reasons. Uh, number one, uh, they use this misunderstood word on last conference call. I don't really get that. Uh, the operating metrics are so much different than what other people in the industry or uh, not necessarily in industry, but other companies similar to uh, Ubiquity are. Uh, the secret sauce being the use Ubiquity community being so many people in there uh, that they've, they've allowed to uh, uh, basically develop their products by getting the community feedback which I don't doubt that they're doing. Uh, and then uh, some shady distributors. Uh, they actually said several, they actually pointed out several of these guys that, uh, you know, these people were selling them. And then this other company in uh, Poland, uh, it looks like they are basically selling ubiquity out of a tent is what it looks like. Again, I can't sit there and tell you that, that that is the case. Uh, cash flow as well as uh, corporate turnover. And uh, the corporate culture. Again, this is all reported in the report that is publicly available. Uh, it's on the screen right now. Again, I do know that there. Is, if you Google Ubiquity right now, there are tons of... Uh, one, I know Ubiquity stock has, has tanked about uh, 10% or so, or 13%. Um, just since this report has came out. There have been several announcements that law firms have announced an investigation in them, uh, etc. Again, is it good or bad? I'm just telling you that this has occurred, and you may want to uh, check into it as well. Uh, there is plenty of uh, news articles and things like that out there that you can actually look at and, and actually understand where everything is. Uh, I do know that they've moved uh, 11 million shares since that announcement pa uh, was passed in, in the 52 weeks. Uh, daily moving average of 527,000. So obviously the, uh, the, the stock has definitely dropped quite a bit uh, due to that. But again, this is just information. It is not stating that they are committing fraud. I, I hope they are not. But again, this is just information that is, uh, you know, that we, that we need to report on and we need to say, hey, here's what's going on in our industry is really the big thing. Yeah, pertinent to our industry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, uh, you know we don't see most of our companies like, uh, uh, you know, we don't see, uh, what is it, Cambium. We don't see Microtech. We don't see uh, Legal Wave. Uh, we don't see... Uh, all those types of manufacturers in the news that much. And they actually reported this on the lo my local TV station. They actually reported it. So, wow. you know, to me, it's it's kind of a, a big deal. But a lot of people may disagree with that. And that's fine. I mean, that's that's everybody's right to disagree with it. Uh, we're just reporting on it as it, uh, you know, as it is. So 
there we go. With that said, I'm uh, I'm out of news. Like I said, we are going to have Bridge Wave on next week. Um, and then uh, that's it. Wispa Palooza. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Wispa Palooza is right around the corner. Um, I believe the Wispa block is closed. I'm pretty sure that uh, it is. I'm trying to look that up right now. Do you book your room. Uh, if not, it is really close to being closed, so you really need to to get on that pretty quickly. Uh, going, going, gone. Yeah, yeah, very, very quickly. October 9th through the 13th, this is the biggest industry trade show uh, in the world. If uh, you don't, if you're not there, yeah, sorry, yeah, that's that's your own issue. <laughs> I will be there all week, and uh, of course, you can uh, see me, uh, Steve. Steven, you're going to make it, right? Absolutely, yeah, I'll yeah, be there all week. Okay. I, I, did, I didn't. I I don't know why I thought that you may not. <laughs> but yeah, actually, I mean, I'm dr I'm driving. Gotcha. Um, the exhibit hall is completely sold out, so we have absolutely uh, over a hundred and I believe a hundred and ten or hundred and thirty exhibitors. Uh, it says 125, so we'll just go with that number. Uh, the exhibit hall is completely sold out. If you have to take the number of hours a day uh, and divide it up between all the days that the exhibit hall is open, uh, you basically have like 10 minutes per, per exhibit or per exhibitor to talk to them. So uh, <laughs> there's a lot there. Um, plus, we have absolutely an awesome schedule. The schedule is uh, online. Uh, we have that available. I'll toss it up on the screen here real quick. Uh, Mondays, we actually have the Master Mondays. These are four-hour sessions that uh, are both business, technical, uh, and regulatory. Uh, I will actually be doing the IPv6 rollout uh, Master Session. So uh, if anybody is in interested in that, you're welcome to attend. Tuesday, we have our opening breakfast speed dating and then uh after lunch uh or lunch uh will be served in the exhibit hall which the exhibit hall will be open and then at 3 p.m we start with our uh tracks so we have technical uh business hr regulatory etc as well uh we have the exhibit hall reception on tuesday then wednesday uh and then we also have the wispa pack annual fundraiser is also uh right after the uh uh the exhibit hall at reception as well, and the CEO and technical roundtables are on uh, Tuesday as well. Wednesday, 8.30 a.m., we start uh, session three, session four, and session five, and session six. Uh, we will have our annual awards banquet dinner. This is, uh, you know, usually awesome food, free drinks, that type of stuff. Uh, we have the exhibit hall will be open right before that, but that is uh, definitely something that everybody really should attend uh, is the Wednesday night uh, annual awards dinner. Thursday is Pink Day. This is uh, when we recommend everybody wear pink. Uh, is also Wispapalooza as well as the uh, sessions will turn into our Fiber Boot Camp. Uh, sessions 7, 8, 9, and 10, and 11 will all go on throughout that day. Uh, Again, as it gets later on the day, we're going to get more into the uh, fiber stuff as well. And then on Friday, we have sessions 12, 13, and 14. Uh, and then we have lunch and closing around uh, 145, as you can see. There are, of course, other events going on. It is a packed week. I recommend everybody pre-plan for what is going on and what is, uh, uh, you know, pre-plan where you want to be. Because uh, it's going to be a busy week, and I look forward to it. Yeah, and uh, will Jim be wearing his pink coveralls? I'm assuming so. I have no idea. And I, you bring I, up a good point with the number of vendors there and the hours a day, hours in the day, ten minutes per booth. That's exactly why we do this show is to bring more time for you to visit with the folks that uh, are at the show to get a more in-depth view of what they do. So that's kind of what the whole reason behind this ISP radio. Oh, yeah. Well, that being said, I'm glad that we have uh, Brad Burwald with uh, Morningstar Corporation. He's the product manager there, and I can attest to the Morningstar Corporation's uh, product lineup. They've done me justice for many years, and 
in co in working together with the variable voltages that Microtech takes. I really like that fact. I use a solar at quite a few sites using the Morning Star products using Microtech because I am not limited to uh, 12, 24, or 48 in these instances using the Microtech. So anyways, with that, I'm going to bring on Brad. Brad, are you there? Yes, I am. Thanks very much, Stephen. You bet. Thanks for being on the show. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and where you came to be with Morningstar and then a little bit into Morningstar and then we'll go into the products. Okay, sure. Yeah, well, again, thanks for having me, uh, both Dennis and Stephen. Happy to participate in the show today. Um, I've been with the company for about 15 years now and my current uh, role is a uh, product manager. So I've been obviously working closely with engineering and getting out in the field and a lot of these industry shows where our products are being used and uh, just getting you know, great feedback and, and taking that right back to the engineering group so we can keep refining the products and releasing new models. And uh, we serve a lot of different industries, so trying to get the specific needs of, of each of them, you know, home market, mobile market, telecommunications, you know, getting that right is uh, a challenge, but uh, we're constantly diversifying the, the product line. Uh, Morningstar has been around for, um, we're actually approaching our 25th anniversary. So we've been doing this for quite some time and even have uh, a lot of members of the staff that have been in solar even well before that. So the off-grid part of the business obviously is a lot longer in life than uh, a lot of the grid connected, which has been more, you know, in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and uh, in Morningstar, we serve a global market. So we're, we're selling around the world, about 80 distributors uh, throughout many, many countries in the world. And we serve all regions, uh, many different markets, but primarily with the focus on you know, a more premium product, highly reliable, and uh, the focus is on battery-based systems. So really any kind of remote power application is uh, what we're best suited for. So, um, and, and a little bit more about my background, I'd, I've worked in sales and a lot of the uh, applications engineering, and now spend a lot of my time, as I said, just doing a lot of training. Go visit their booth when they're there. Yes, we'll definitely be at the show, uh, participating in several ways, be doing one of the, the part of the backup power panel discussion uh, with a few other uh, guests as well. We're doing a training on Monday, uh, quite a lengthy one, so we'll cover uh, much more detail than I can get into today, as well as sizing, a lot of data connectivity questions. Obviously, it's going to be of uh, great interest to the WISP market and uh, a lot of the finer details of battery charging and uh, setup. One thing I really like about this show and, and these customers in general is a very technical group, so I can, don't have to hold back with uh, all my tech speak so and and of course uh, definitely want to get questions from everyone on uh, what they want to see and then we will be exhibiting so we'll have our products there and uh, a couple of us will be there uh, to take any questions throughout the week so definitely uh, we've been at a few of these shows at Wisp America earlier on and had just sort of got into the this show and this industry in more detail as we branch out and uh, it's definitely one that I uh, enjoy very much good Okay, so uh, with that being said, uh, I can uh, definitely talk about some of the products today and a little bit about some of the, the differences in the controllers and some detail and try to make as many uh, specific references to the applications that you guys are doing today. And definitely would encourage, um, Stephen, as you said, if your viewers are able to uh, chat in questions and you want to hit me with those maybe at the end or even during the presentation, if it's pertinent, I'm happy to take those at any time. Perfect. Okay. So I'll go ahead and uh, jump into the presentation here. Yeah, bear with me as I jump around a little bit because I have some specific topics that I want to kind of cover uh, in more detail. So let me uh, get going with the presentation. One sec. Okay, so um, just to give a, a quick overview, as we said, uh, we're really focused on off-grid solar power. So some of the many applications we cover, um, residential, mobile, oil and gas, and a few others you can see here. In the telecommunication space, uh, clearly the WISP market is a good fit because you've got a lot, uh, you know, more of a, you know, dealer-focused product. These are a lot smaller systems. There's many, many customers, and they're deploying, you know, I'd say fairly low-power systems throughout the country and, and even internationally. So that's definitely a good fit for solar. With the declining module prices and a lot of the technological advances, you know, we, we see this industry is growing quite a bit. And as I said, we appreciate you know supporting uh, these kind of small businesses that are doing these sorts of applications. In telecom, though, we we do expand into a lot larger systems. We've been doing a lot of VSAT and um, small cell equipment, uh, especially in Africa. It maybe even has a satellite-based backhaul, so that's been a growing market. 
and as you can see from some of the photos, done a lot of microwave and uh, even pretty large cellular BTS. There's a, a pretty big market for diesel genset operation that's switching from 100% genset to solar. So that's also a market that we cover. Uh, but as I said, in, in North America, a lot of these you know, 10, 15, 20 watt products uh, that are in the WISP market um, can easily be powered with solar exclusively uh, and, and quite reliably because of the, the power needs. So what I will cover here a little bit is we're, we basically cover both off-grid with DC loads. I think that's the majority of the networking equipment comes in 12, 24, 48. So we have that easily covered with our products because we offer a lot of these features. Uh, 48 volts, you know, is often a common telecom standard, uh, positively ground, but we see a, a lot of 24 volt systems as well, and a lot of our products cover that range. Uh, we do have a inverter product that is built for the off grid. This is definitely not your uh, your typical Walmart or uh, truck stop type inverter. This is um, the Sure Sign is built for a rugged, fanless design for off grid operation. Really clean sine wave output. So we do offer a small 300 watt. Uh, sine wave inverter if a customer does need some AC at the site or if you've just got such a mix of product that you want to use AC to kind of power everything then that's a, a common bus so both of those are covered um, battery charging is of course the focus of our products and I uh, really want to uh, accentuate the fact that you know taking good care of the battery is probably the key to a lot of the longevity and the reliability of the system um, you'll hear a lot about lithium ion and that's definitely entering the market uh, but sealed lead acid is by far still, you know, the big, biggest uh, product that's being used in the industry just because it's reliable, pretty cost effective. And, uh, you know, if it's designed right and the battery's taken good care of, then what we can do is definitely see, you know, battery lives of four to five years is easily achievable if uh, you've got, you know, plenty of solar power. And, and we get a lot of questions about, you know, site choice, like, oh, is this only going to really work well? And, Arizona, New Mexico, these really sunny climates, and uh, you know we we can easily get reliable operation all over the country. Uh, I often remind customers the biggest solar market in the world is actually Germany, which has about as much sun as uh, Maine. So you know you definitely don't you don't have to think that if you're not in uh, you know sunny Florida or in the the desert that uh, solar is not right. It's it's definitely uh, going to provide a, a lot of power. Um, so to cover the, the solar charge controller, you know, benefits, uh, we, we definitely prevent overcharging of the battery, increase the battery life. We have uh, various types of controllers, which I'll go into a little bit here in a minute. Uh, load management, you know, our goal is to not see the load disconnect because obviously, especially for you guys, that means you've got some unhappy customers. But there are extreme cases where, you know, the battery is uh, going to meet at an untimely end if it doesn't protect itself. So that is kind of a, a, an emergency option, but with proper sizing and maintenance, that'll definitely uh, be in good shape. Uh, we do cover some lighting control applications uh, in different markets. Uh, system information, you know, status, metering. Uh, since the controller kind of sees everything of what's going in and out of it in terms of charging, uh, battery health, and what the loads are taking, uh, there's a lot of information to be had from the meter display. Uh, we do a lot more data logging. And then uh, lastly, an important topic for this industry and, and what I'll, I'll go into a lot greater detail um, at during Wispapalooza as well is uh, remote communications. And this is something we kind of pride ourselves in because we were the first to offer some connectivity options on charge controllers well over a decade ago when they just weren't all that intelligent and weren't all that connected. And, you know, you're going to hear a lot of buzz nowadays with uh, the uh, Internet of Things and the Industrial Internet of Things, which, you know, many people have just called, you know, SCADA or remote monitoring in the past. But that's become a standard option on most of our products and, a, and an accessory or a, an optional choice uh, on almost every product we offer. And we've got some coming cloud uh, data acquisition products that are coming along and um, better and better adoption of SNMP clearly is in our sites for our product roadmap. So uh, look to see a lot of uh, remote communications options coming from us uh, in the near future. And the, the thing about the solar charge controller is it represents about 10% of total system cost in a lot of these smaller systems. But if you look at the overall operational lifetime cost of a site, it can drop well below 5% because if it's, uh, you know, you go through a couple battery cycles and and you know your investment in your solar modules is a 20-year investment hopefully uh you know then if you pick the right product up front you can see uh you know some pretty rel reliable operation in these systems 
And obviously, you don't want to have a controller failure because that means pretty much a total system failure. You lose your loads, your batteries are, are left undercharged, and your uh, your PV is not being put to use. So uh, when, we, when we get asked about our controller family and what represents our product line, it really falls into two categories, and this would be pulse width modulation, you know, which is PWM, and uh, maximum power point tracking, which is our MPPT line. And really, uh, MPPT is the newer and more sophisticated and and possibly better optimized solution in a lot of cases, but I don't want to count PWM out because it is still a good bang for your buck. It is more cost effective, and depending on the module choice and what it is you're really trying to do with the system, PWM controllers are, are definitely still in the game in a big way, and we've actually released uh, two models just this past year in the PWM line, so you'll look to see both of those as um, being available in the, the coming future. So a quick discussion of the tech here, PWM, it's just basically a switch. We vary the pulsing to charge the battery, keeps the battery healthy, and allows us to control current. doesn't do a lot of DC to DC. It can't really take lower or higher voltages and, and convert those to different battery voltages. So it kind of comes in at one voltage and goes out at the same voltage. Um, when you get to, uh, I'll jump ahead <coughs> here, to MPPT, that's actually a DC to DC converter, so we're actually able to take a much wider voltage input. We can work with a wider variety of modules. A lot of the ones that are optimized for the grid market, we can put back to use for off-grid with this uh, much wider input range. And then, as I said, this will cover 12, 24, 48-volt systems. So um, as we get into some of the differences here, um, really MPPT it is going to better extract power out of that module because it's not forcing the module to operate at battery voltage. It can kind of let it operate at its max power point and the controller will actually track and sweep the array in order to maximize what it's going to deliver. So in terms of getting your maximum wattage out, the MPPT definitely has some benefits, but does come at a little bit of a cost premium. So it depends on a lot of your systems. Um, one of the things that is the biggest impact is temperature of the module, and uh, that's something to uh, take into account. So let me get a little bit here into uh, some of the product families, and uh, I'll start with the PWM controllers. Uh, one of the, the nice benefits of uh, Morningstar's product line is it's got a lot of longevity. We try to keep the product line consistent. Um, these are products you can count on for, for many years of availability, and we've had a lot of generational upgrades to our products. Our ProStar product line is actually on the third generation now, so we keep kind of keeping the technology updated and making sure that a lot of the features are kept current. As I said, adding data communications and using the latest uh, you know chipsets from the uh, the processor lines that we utilize, um, and this represents really a spread from all the way of uh, down to the little SunGuard here, um, which is just a five amp charger, all the way up to our TriStar controller, which uh, tops out at about 60 amps at 48 volts. So on a large telecom system, as I said, we've done some cell towers. We might see several of these in parallel, and, and it's not uncommon to see, you know, from 5 to 10 kilowatts of uh, PV utilized. Now, for your market, uh, generally, I think most systems are pretty well covered in the, the 200 to maybe 1,000 watt PV range. So the ProStar product, I've always said, is sort of the really at the sweet spot for the WISP market. It's dual voltage. Um, covers uh, both 12 and 24 volt and really covers the power ranges that are going to take care of most of your your radios. So even if you have some some backhaul and a couple other you know access points on a single tower, maybe 40, 50 watts for, uh, worth of draw, the ProStar is definitely going to be able to take care of that. And with the recent upgrade uh, on the data side, you know I think more and more is going to meet your needs uh, going forward. So there's kind of a summary of the, the PWM line. Um, again, all of our products really designed for extreme environments, many of these being rated up to 60C ambient. And I know that sounds a little on the high side, but, um, you know, we, I just got done talking to a customer in Oman. He's doing oil and gas monitoring, and, you know, they're regularly seeing 45 degrees. And if uh, the system box is often in the sun, which unfortunately it can be at times, you know, they might see higher than that. So definitely these are uh, power ranges that are, that are seen there. So a uh, quick overview, our, our SunSaver product. Uh, this is actually one of the first products we ever produced going back to the early 90s, currently on the third generation, used in a lot of oil gas applications. Uh, 
you'll notice if you ever pry any of our products open, a lot of them are epoxy encapsulated. So this is going to be sealed and uh, really adds to the longevity of the circuit board. Uh, all of our products are fanless as well. And you can see from our little icons here, we're, we're trying to do the right thing and more and more provide the ETL listings and the UL listings and uh, FCC certs that we need to put in place for you know quality products. We want them to be noise-free, quiet, reliable, safe, you know, and trying to differentiate ourselves a little bit from some of the, um, the cheaper import stuff that you see floating in on uh, Alibaba and other sites like that. Um, so as I said, our ProStar product recently transitioned to the Gen 3, um, 15 or 30 amps of charging, 12 or 24 volt, definitely some overload capabilities. We've got a nice new meter design on there and also is available with um, our uh, serial interface for data. And I'll, I'll cover a little bit more of that here uh, in the coming slides. So let me jump ahead. Uh, TriStar product, also very commonly used in uh, this market, um, supports solar charging. Uh, for a lot of wind enthusiasts, which I did learn that there are quite a few of um, within your industry, we've got a uh, option to do diversion control, which is a type of charge control for the battery that supports uh, wind charging. So I'll be um, teaming up with... Um, uh, Mark Demmer from Mission Critical and Wind and be talking a little bit about that at the show. So definitely bring your wind questions as well because you may often find that, uh, especially with these sites, if you're up on a, a tower and it's a pretty high elevation or in a good location to get you know both some sun and wind, that that combination of power together is uh, kind of a nice fit because it just happens that uh, when the wind's blowing, it might be a little on the cloudy side and when it's bright and sunny, it can be a little more still and uh, you definitely want power in uh, both those situations. So we definitely can support some uh, wind options as well. You'll see uh, nice big heat sinks on a lot of our products. And as I said, this, uh, this product's got a, a 232 connection. But I do want to note, um, we do have, for the majority of our product line now, we have an optional Ethernet uh, offering. So any of our products, even down to our smaller ones, if you do want Ethernet connectivity, and you want to be able to see what the site's doing and get an IP address there. And we've got a, a, a little web-based GUI that's built into the box. You can connect to it via Modbus. Um, we've got a coming cloud data service and um, SNMP functionality. So really, any kind of flavor of uh, data communication or even control is available to you uh, on a lot of these products. So um, now to cover a little bit of the MPPT controller line, this is... Uh, as I said, a more sophisticated product has a DC to DC converter on the front end. And unlike the PWM, what you'll see with the MPPT is you'll see an input voltage range. Like for instance, our uh, TriStar PPT can take anything from battery voltage up to 150 volts open circuit. So it makes it easier to wire modules up. Um, often if you've got a, a good distance of wire between your module uh, array and the controller, you might actually choose to wire it for a higher voltage so you can use smaller wire. You can get a, a better run in there and uh, minimizes your voltage drop. Our 600 volt controller is actually our highest rated product. Definitely a premium one. Um, the, the telecom application I showed in the beginning there was actually a microwave repeater that was in the uh, up on the high uh, north locations in Canada. It's using our 600 volt controller. And that's because they had actually a greater than 100 meter run between the PV and the um, and the, the telecom power shed where they needed to get the power. So that comes in handy in those applications. So uh, just do a little little brief coverage here of the different models. Our SunSaver MPPT, little guy, uh, takes 200 or 400 watts depending on your voltage. Uh, very, very accurate PowerPoint tracker, some communications options. Um, again, this is a potted product. And you'll see our TrackStar badging on a lot of these products, which is our secret sauce for uh, maximizing the, uh, the efficiency and energy out of the module. Um, as I mentioned, our ProStar PPT is a, a variation of the ProStar in the MPPT version, and a uh, much newer product came out last year. Again, a lot of sophistication, uh, added the ETL and uh, IEC certifications. I, You know, I've always wondered, and I hope to learn at this show a little bit better, but you know, the WISP market, if any of you guys are doing uh, business overseas as well, I don't know if uh, anyone ever gets on some some uh, trekking uh, outback or in Latin America or Africa, some possibly some mission work that we've seen where they're doing some uh, 
NGO work for uh, telecommunications, but a lot of these products are used in those markets, and, and we try to satisfy uh, the technical needs of those, those areas as well. Um, the uh, TriStar MPPT version, again, up to about 3.2 kilowatts of power and lots of options available for communications. This product was actually the first <clears throat> that had such a, a common need for data communications that uh, we actually built Ethernet into it directly. So it's got it built in natively. It doesn't have to be added as an option. So uh, that was sort of what got us into the IP world. And um, the nice thing of using the uh, communication standards like Modbus and SNMP is that it gets picked up by a lot of uh, OEMs that want to do power packages. So, and you again, say that, some, you have something interesting here that pulled my attention. Lightning and transient surge protection. Is that only on the TriStar? No, that is actually a feature on um, on pretty much all of our products. It it definitely varies based on the size of the product. You know, obviously with the bigger ones, we can you know afford to build in a little bit more. But yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out because obviously with towers, uh, <laughs> you know, large metal objects pointing towards the sky, that uh, that would be a concern for you guys. Uh, so if I can touch on that for a second, um, all of our products have uh, they use TVSs. Okay, these are transient voltage suppressors. And they are basically right on the board. Another term that they're often referred to as is uh, transorbs. And what they do is they will they will react very very quickly. And unlike MOVs, which have their own you know place and role as well in the system, the TVSs they don't actually degrade over time. So they'll they'll shunt current to ground uh, in the case of a high voltage spike. They activate at just a little bit higher than the max PV input voltage of the controller. And those, in the case of the uh, TriStar PBT, I think the rating is uh, 4,500 watts. So, you know, it's a fair amount of protection built in. Um, I want to note that's not designed necessarily for system level protection. We're not there to protect the whole tower. For that, we definitely recommend a, a third party solution that maybe is MOV based that can handle a lot more juice. Um, you know, maybe some uh, varistors or other products that are available from Delta. Uh, Midnight makes a good one. But our TVSs are built in, really, it's to protect the controller itself from these little surges that can um, pop MOSFETs. So, so that does that, that's included in the Sun Savers? Yep, Sun Savers have them, Pro Stars yeah. have them, um, Tri Stars. Yeah, pretty much everything because it's, it's really our best line of defense against those little, you know, it's not the direct strikes. There's not much you can do about those, uh, nope. but it's the induced. Uh, voltage that can uh, cause damage to the processor or some of the MOSFETs. So we build that into every product. But yeah, as I said, the MOV level protection for the system is uh, definitely recommended as well. So there's our uh, our 600 volt controller. Um, definitely, a, uh, that's 48 volt only. So really would be on your larger systems, but uh, it's a little bit unique in the market. It gives you a really high voltage input. So, all right. Um, let me. Jump ahead a little bit here. Uh, here's some shots of uh, our epoxy encapsulation that I wanted to talk about because really the robustness of a lot of these controllers, if you guys want to see products that are going to last, you can come back and, and see them in the field for you know years into the future. A lot of these uh, mechanical designs, uh, conformal coating that we use to seal the circuit board, that's used as well and is one of the things that uh, differentiates the products from the, you know, the uh, overseas competition. There's our, our track star. If you don't mind, let me jump ahead a few slides and I can get into a few of the other components. Um, we do offer a pretty broad line of accessories as well, remote meter options, some different communications adapters. I uh, want to mention our, our meter hub there and our relay driver are used for larger systems. If you ever have a need for some relay switching, it's sort of like a programmable PLC. You can give it some conditions, high or low voltage or charge current or temperature. You can control up to four relays, so that gives you some nice options if you want to uh, do some things with <clears throat> load control or switching of uh, products in the field. Sort of a nice Swiss Army knife of functionality that, that gives you some benefits and works along nicely with the charge controllers. Have you and seen it used for uh, like switching a relay to turn on a generator when the batteries look yes. like they're going to die? Yeah, that's that's a common use. We've even seen uh, customers set it up for low temperature operation. They can use it as like a generator uh, exercise as well to kind of give the, the generator a, a quick run when it's extremely cold to make sure it's, you know, things are moving around in there and it's not going to seize up on you. But uh, yeah, it's, it's used, there's a lot of, um, you know, open and closed relays for alarm indication. Um, as you said, gen start, 
uh, even for um, load control. So some customers may want to have a tiered load disconnect, like if their power gets low, they really don't want to see everything just collapse, and then you got to go to the site. So they could set it up to possibly disconnect, you know, the radios or, you know, you don't want to disconnect customers if you don't have to, but you could shut down some of the loads, but you could still keep, you know, say the backhaul in place. You can still communicate with the site, see what's going on, you know, what happened, uh, maybe, you know, turn things back on once things are in better shape, you know, so the really driver offers a lot of that functionality. So um, I'll be discussing... Um, one of the most common questions, uh, I'm kind of covering our product line here, but the most common questions we get at the shows, and one which I'm going to go into a lot of detail at Wispa Plus on Monday, and the tech training is much more on on sizing of the products, you know, both for the controllers as well as for the system, because there's all sorts of things to cover there, you know, to maintain your operational lifetime and how many days of cloudy weather the system can handle. One thing I wanted to point out is we've got a string calculator on our website. We actually subscribe to a database of PV modules. There's literally thousands of them in the market, and we uh, keep a subscription and keep all those updated to the best of, we, of our abilities, and we'll allow you to go in and select a Morningstar product. And if you tell us a little bit about your battery and your temperature ranges that you experience, then we'll, we'll give you a proper uh, size and configuration for your array and tell you what options you have. So that's a pretty handy tool. Um, Let's see, let me kind of jump through a little bit of the details here and get into something on the data side, if you don't mind. Let me race through here. Um, okay, so one of the things that uh, is talked a lot about with our products is, uh, you know, setup and proper sizing for batteries. And uh, what we do is, as I said, we do support sealed lead acid and flooded lead acid batteries. You're probably going to want sealed or maintenance free mostly in these difficult to reach sites. But all the products have standard defaults that are, are chosen for certain types of batteries and you get a quick little selection on the dip switches. Um, you can actually go in and you can customize those settings on any of our products and you can program exactly what you want in terms of temperature compensation and, and it, whether or not you want to do a little boost charge. Uh, what you know voltages if you want to float um, a lot of these systems are designed to uh, you know have a much lower float voltage if they get full that'll maintain their lifetime um, and as I said using our software you can even reprogram these remotely if you want to change settings in the field and then actually reset the controller to utilize these new settings um, we get a lot of questions on battery types because there's a lot of new chemistries out there and there's too much to go into today but uh, I'll cover a little bit of those at the show. And also, if you look on our website, we're doing a lot more with coordinating with the different battery manufacturers. So a lot of the bigger name brands, we've got preset configuration files that we've put on our website that are available for download. So you can kind of start with a template that we've already worked out, that we've endorsed, that the manufacturer's endorsed, and then you can kind of take it from there. And we get into all sorts of uh, you know nickel cadmium, and as I said, lithium ion becoming more and more interesting in um, really it's utilized in the, the residential market, but we're probably going to be see it more and more in off grid. And, you know, with some of the cycle life of these lithium ion batteries, when the costs definitely come down and are more in line with what, uh, you know, people can invest in for these sites, you know, you could definitely see some 10 year lifetimes for these batteries. So it's great. Um, there's a little overview of our meter display and we've kind of consolidated our meter design to be consistent and give you some data logging functionality there with some graphing and a lot easier setup and uh, allows you to really dive into the details on a lot of these uh, set points. So give me one second here. I will jump ahead to one other area that I want to cover. Okay. Um, quickly, if you want to see... Um, a couple of our applications, because customers do say, you know, what, what are you guys typically used in and where are your areas? I can cover some telecom-related systems here if you guys want a, a bit of a, a flavor for what we do. Um, this was that 600-volt project I told you about. You can see that there's a pretty heavy repeater there, uh, microwave. Uh, obviously, based on the size of those fuel tanks, these guys are <laughs> setting this system up to, to last the whole winter so that they don't have to take a helicopter back up there. And the 600 volt controllers were used because of the great distance there between the PV uh, location for the modules and where the actual power shed was housed. So uh, a lot of benefit there with the 
the high voltage wiring runs. And uh, this site, definitely they have communications in place because uh, you don't want to be going up here to, uh, you know, turn, in, turn it off and turn it back on again. It's not something that's uh, cost effective. Um, and we've got some sites here we actually did in Nepal, um, BTS towers, where we've got some pretty robust battery banks, probably bigger than a lot of these sites you guys are doing for WISP sites uh, and some other backup sites. So one thing I did want to get to uh, within our time frame here, uh, how are you doing on time, guys? You think we're, we're looking another five or ten minutes? Yeah, we're good. You keep going. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I did want to cover the EMC-1 because this is something that really is up uh, the alley for this industry, and, and it will actually be a pretty big topic uh, of our, our presentation at the show. Um, so, you know, all of our products have kind of a standard Modbus serial interface, which is pretty vanilla, um, but it gets the job done. It's reliable, and people are happy with it. The SCADA oil gas market, you know, they're still big on RS-232, so that's certainly available. Uh, you know, we know things are headed towards uh, Ethernet. We want to have that at least as an option on the majority of our products. So we offered our uh, EMC-1, all right? So that product plugs into any of our existing controllers and gives you uh, the ability to get an IP address. So now you don't just have Modbus serial, you've got Modbus IP. You've got a nice little served web page, uh, you know, port 80 HTML coming out of that Ethernet connection. And you also get, of course, an IP address that you can hit on a different port if you want to talk Modbus. And there's a lot of third-party Modbus communications applications out there. We can send out um, SNMP traps, and we're actually working on a, a more sophisticated um, MIB file for SNMP that will support all the controllers and really want to get plugged into a lot of these ISP management software programs and a lot of the SNMP management servers get some you know templates and some broader industry support for that so that you can kind of just plug in a Morningstar product and get all your data and not have to do you know a whole lot of configuration so that'll be uh, coming the, the EMC is out now for standard Modbus and, and our what we call our live view web page and then a lot of the SNMP is coming um, you know very soon so a little bit of the history there we just are seeing so much more remote communications See, the nice thing about your sites is obviously you are the network provider, so network connect connectivity is kind of coming along with the package, but a lot of our other solar sites, um, you know, they, they don't have the connectivity, so they're looking for a lot of these newer wireless standards that are a little more optimized for, you know, machine communications, as I said, IoT, you know, better and cheaper gateways, uh, maybe even optimized for lower bandwidth, but much more cost-effective and power-conscious, so I've been following a lot of the the cellular standards that are coming out with um, a lot of the, the more narrow band and these IoT standards that are coming along shortly. Um, as I said, we, we even do some satellite communications. We did a deployment in Ghana actually for about 200. Uh, they were basically satellite backhaul 2G uh, cellular access points, you know, because everybody wants cellular even, even in the far remote areas. And there's still a lot you can do with SMS and a Nokia burner phones, so you know those guys want access, and that's one way to get it to them. Because uh, you know, I don't think we're going to see fiber in that location anytime soon. <laughs> so, and you know, and I, I have not trudged through uh, you know much of Western Africa as much as our installers have, but I have been there, and you know, it's it's a whole other world, that's for sure. So the EMC option uh, operation is again, as I said, connectivity. It's actually port powered, or you can connect it. And you know what? A big issue I see with a lot of these sites um, with is power compatibility, because you get a lot of communications equipment, and guess what? It's PoE, and it's got a narrower operational band for voltage, and it's got um, you know a battery that's going to be going up and down. It's not powered by a wall wart, and uh, that causes a lot of grief at these sites. And what we wanted to do with this product is offer a nice broad uh, eight to eighty volt input range. And that's a power supply of our own design for the off-grid market, and you'll see that on a lot of other products, so that you don't have to worry about, you know, fluctuations in battery voltage or, you know, my my equipment is my site's, you know, 24 volt, but I, I need a 12 volt power supply, and I can't use a wall wart because there's no AC. You know, we're trying to get away from a lot of that. Uh, very low self-consumption on that product, just two watts. Um, you know, it's got some communications there. And, you know, we, we have a basic uh, GUI here for your network connectivity. Nothing like you guys set up on a lot of your routers, but we've got a fair amount of options there, and it's a pretty standard flavor. 
Um, we do give a nice little web interface you can connect to directly if you've got the, the port access and the proper connectivity and uh, gives you the, the basics, runs right out of the box. Uh, we give you some data logging options as well so you can look back. Um, you know, we don't see a, a lot of um, long-term operations, so we, we typically give you anywhere from 30 to some of the newer products give you up to 256 days of data logging. But the nice thing is you basically want to see, like, well, what happened right before I had to show up at the site? You know, what? <laughs> obviously you're there, something went wrong, uh, or you can connect to it remotely and, and see why you're getting some issues, and uh, you can kind of see the days that led up to the event in terms of power. And again, at the show, I'll be going into a lot of detail here on, you know, some analysis, post-mortem, um, you know, analyzing your data logging files. Now, besides the web GUI, we also offer a utility called MSView. And if you really want some granular data, you know, you, you maybe you want to look at a, a day's worth of operational information and really see how your load's behaving. You know, when's it drawing peak power? Does it go to sleep? Uh, during, um, you know, like some low power instances and really seeing how it's behaving, you can get data as, as frequently as every five seconds and you can get a nice CSV file there. And, you know, that is kind of the, uh, the buzzword nowadays is, you know, learning about uh, analytics and how can we really see through the numbers and learn more about our sites. And, and we definitely want to enable that. Um, let me jump ahead through some of this. There's our, our battery operating ranges that, um, you know, give you guys a broad range. We, we mostly see 24 and 48 with a lot of these systems. Do you, do you guys see many 12-volt powered equipment, or is it more 24 and 48 nowadays? I, I have a site that's been running for about eight years on one battery with a SunSaver 6 on it, and it 12 volts powers that Microtech. And if I add, if I add like 10 more customers to it, i probably got to throw another battery in there. But uh, mm -hmm. I do run 12 volts, uh, you know, a Microtech with two radios in it. Yeah, yeah, I gotcha. Um, okay, well, good. Well, I'm jumping around a little bit here on the uh, on the um, some of my additional slides, but um, one thing I also wanted to talk about is that Morningstar has a um, a cloud service as well that we'll be um, sort of debuting. We actually were at Solar Power International, also in Vegas. I'm finding myself in Vegas a lot these days, <laughs> and uh, not that that's a bad thing, but um, the, the the debut of our Envision service will also be coming um, at the show, uh, you know, that we have here in the, um, in the couple of weeks at Wispapalooza, and we'll be talking a lot about that. And I think what generally the data needs that we see a lot of customers fall into are, are a few different categories, not so much protocol, but either they say, you know, we have networking expertise, just give us an IP address, let us know how to communicate with it, and we can kind of take it from there. So we see, again, with your industry, the demand is SNMP. They've got a system that's already in place. They're managing the equipment that way. They want to manage the controller that way as well. You know, so we can offer that. The other category, maybe outside your industry, is where you don't have necessarily the, the networking background, but that doesn't mean they don't want to monitor their sites. I mean, the customers, they, they want what they want, and they need to know, you know, what's going on at these sites. So you know, what we're doing is we planned ahead a little bit with our EMC device, and that actually has a pretty substantial processor in it and a fair amount of flash, and we've got some future compatibility and upgrades that are going to be coming along. So what we did is we went ahead and put a, a very lightweight um, real-time operating system on there, and we have a, uh, let's just say, a cloud data agent that gives us the ability to provide some, some push data functionality to the device to a cloud service that we're able to offer. So if a customer is not in the habit of, you know, managing the uh, connectivity and just wants something where he plugs it in, gives it a connection, uh, a gateway, and uh, wants it to just start collecting data and not have to think about it too much, then we can offer that option. You flip a dip switch, you enter an activation code, it provides a, a, a link with the certificate management, everything's encrypted. Um, it actually uses a protocol called uh, MQTT, which is sort of a, a very lightweight IoT-focused protocol. And the goal with this service, with Envision, is to allow management of uh, a massive amount of controllers. You know, you can only you can only connect to so many devices at once and kind of see what's going on. If you want them to sort of feed the data back, so that you can look at 
you know, hundreds of sites at a time and sort of pinpoint the products that are having difficulty, you know, what's in fault and, you know, kind of isolate issues across a pretty broad uh, deployment, then uh, that would be the way to do it, you know, through the, the cloud management. And then we have the ability to, um, you know, in the future, provide more and more resolution on our data and also, um, you know, have the ability to deploy firmware updates. Uh, you could push settings out in mass across, you know, certain applications. And we're really trying to step up our, our operations and maintenance and, and data logging uh, functionality with the products. So look for a lot more of that. Uh, the nice thing is now that we've got the technology embedded on the hardware side, if you get that at the site, you know, we can, uh, we can focus on the web front end and, and do a lot more there with uh, enhancements and uh, put some things in place so we can really hear back from our customers and, and provide a good roadmap on you, where you guys would like to see that product go. And the Great. nice thing with the EMC is that it, it's, you know, I, I have to explain this to a lot of customers, not so much for the WISP industry, but, you know, it, it can do multiple things at the same time. If you need to hit the IP direct, and you can, you can do that. The cloud service runs in the background on a, on a different sort of uh, thread. Um, the web GUI is always there. You know, you can definitely use it in more than one way if you wish. One of our customers was saying, well, I, I, I've got uh, so many sites, I kind of just want to see, you know, what's going on, where to focus. And then once I isolate a problem, you know, I have the connectivity that I can actually connect to your product directly with MSView, and then I can do some very detailed analysis of what's happening. And we think that's a good way to, to handle the sites as well. Kind of get the 10,000-foot view and then zero in on maybe the sites where you really want to understand a lot more about what's going on. So, and as I said, you know, optimize the data. We're hoping with a lot of these, uh, you know, MVNO kind of virtual network operators that are providing machine-focused data plans, uh, better connectivity, you know, that that's going to be easier to deploy in the future. So we're looking at, you know, 10 to 20 megs per site uh, will give you a fair amount of resolution, you know, and then we'll be able to tell you, you know, what to expect from a lot of these sites as we get more of them connected. Right, right. So, yeah, so that's a little bit about the cloud service. Uh, and as I said, want to plunge into a lot more detail, uh, you know, during the conference on a lot of these. Um, our Envision service will actually be slated to be officially released um, to the market around November timeframe is what we're looking at right now. So we're currently in beta testing. And uh, by the way, since I'm talking to a, uh, a select group of uh, listeners here, if anyone's interested in beta connectivity, you've got our existing products in place. Most likely they've got our existing data port. Uh, even if you need a new controller, we can be in touch with you, but we definitely want someone with a, a, a network capable site uh, that has the, the background that can support something like this. If you'd like to uh, get some of those initial units and give it a try, uh, definitely be in contact with me. All right. So you mentioned a good point. How do we get in contact with you? Uh, you can reach me direct. Um, let me jump ahead to my final slide. Uh, there is our website. And let me just give you my email address. Uh, first initial B and last name, Burwald. That's uh, B-E-R-W-A-L-D at MorningstarCorp.com. So just send an email to me or... Uh, you know, check a look at our website for updates on the on the product release. But uh, as I said, being in the product management, I head up the beta program for a lot of these products, and uh, that's happening uh, literally this week as we speak. So if anyone wants to uh, reach out to me, I'd be happy to talk to you because really, uh, the, a lot of these sites are the perfect fit. Exactly. Uh, low voltage and and connected. So. Mm -hmm. Dennis, were there any questions on the? chat no there was not so uh looks like we're pretty pretty good uh actually he gave a a really great presentation i'm looking forward to uh you know uh, using their products i think i've already uh done some of them but definitely not a big deal uh other than that everything's uh, really good i think uh the like i said the presentation was excellent so you know everybody can uh, learn a little bit more i actually had a question and uh, maybe you are not the person to ask, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Sure. What is up with the negative 48 volt, where the positive on the ground? Yeah. Well, is there <laughs> is there a? I mean that that's kind of more of a general question. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I, is there a reason I, for I, it? <laughs> yeah. Th this is funny because I, 
it's it's definitely I, there's a few things I can say about that and it and I don't know if I have all the answers but I can tell you a little bit about what I've heard so yeah the 48 volt you know that's the most common that we see and I think if I look back into the history a little bit it's sort of stuck as a standard I don't know that it's as critical now because I think its original need is not as common in the market but it's definitely the telecom standard choice even all these BTS systems we see it as a requirement and we can support it just fine. You know, typically we see negatively grounded systems, um, but the controllers doesn't have a problem if you ground it on the positive. You just can't create any ground loops. Um, in terms of the origination of the need, I've read a few things about, I think it had to do with maybe corrosion prevention in the beginning, because I know with a lot of the, the uh, pots, you know, in the original copper telephone lines that there was some kind of ground issue with the sheathing and I think if they reversed the voltage across those products or across those wires that it would prevent corrosion. That's what someone had told me and that it kind of became the standard for your central offices for your you know telecom copper distribution years ago is what I had heard and that it then became a standard from then on and then you know why it's still used at a lot of these wireless sites because you don't really have copper in the ground much anymore, and uh, it's gone the fiber and wireless. Um, you know, that's that's sort of what I've read. Um, I don't know if that helps, but it, it's a little bit of kind of industry lore on the originations of it. But all I know is it's uh, anytime we see that uh, PG positive ground designation or that negative 48 volts, um, you know, we're 99.9% .9 sure it's a, a telecommunications application. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, but it, we actually had a smaller version of our ProStar product that, that had since been discontinued just because it was not used as much. Typically, when we see a positive ground system, it's it's a pretty good size site. It's used on our TriStars, probably multiples. The largest site we ever did with positive ground actually had 13 of our TriStars. I think it was 22 kilowatts. I mean, this was a, a very large system. Obviously, had a, a diesel gen set uh, as a backup. Um, and they can get, like I showed you that microwave site, they can get pretty sophisticated, but those are, uh, those are typically positive ground. The positive ground version of the ProStar is not offered any longer and was discontinued, but um, like I said, it is still supported. And we have some new products, uh, some even larger, higher power um, MPPTs, uh, upwards of 100 amps uh, slated on the, uh, the R&D side. So that'll be coming along soon. Wow. Hey, Brad, uh this morning or uh, yeah this morning i saw that you guys are doing some uh, webinars could you tell us a little bit about those if people are interested yeah definitely i think our next one is slated for um september 27th so we're looking at just a week from now uh those are given on our website for anybody that wants to sign up definitely can get in communications with you um you know we really uh you know there's a lot of us here our sales engineers are all engineers and like to talk tech we've got app engineers we've got a really dedicated support site as I said, uh, you know, Morningstar is a U.S.-based company entirely, and um, we're always here. If you guys have questions, just uh, pick up the phone and reach out. These webinars are a big way we uh, reach out to customers and, and like to get into details. We often do a uh, general charge controller overview, a little bit similar to what I did just now, uh, but we also do some industry-specific uh, applications as well, so uh, definitely keep an eye out. Just sign up for those. Uh, we even provide some um, very unusual time uh, webinars as well, so we can reach our friends in uh, Asia and Australia. So uh, you'll see that there's several to choose from. Um, and we do also archive most of them on our YouTube channel. So if you want to look at our YouTube channel, a great way to uh, enjoy your lunch is to look back at the Morningstar webinars of days past and learn about some specific products or, or topics that you might be interested in. So. Sure. Well, we appreciate you being on the show today. Uh, when you come to Wispa Palooza, bring uh, that inverter. I want to look at that. Okay, I will. I yeah. uh, definitely you got to you got to pick it up to sort of fully experience it because it's a little on the heavy side and it's uh, designed for, as I said, it's fanless and very robust. So we'll definitely have one of those you guys can take a look at, and cool. uh, as well as the rest of the products, we'll be doing some uh, demos of our cloud service, and uh, yeah, bring your bring your tech because I'm happy to talk about. Like I said, I enjoy this show a lot and uh, sort of the, the types of customers that we get to uh, interact with. So Perfect. Well, I want to thank Brad 
Burwald with Morningstar for being on the show. Dennis, you want to wrap the show up? Yep. Well, thank you all for uh, listening in. Have a great week. Okay. Thanks very much, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to ISP Radio. We hope you've gained new insights and additional wisdom in our industry as well as your business. Please remember to visit our show sponsors via the links on ISPRadio.com. If you're interested in becoming a show sponsor, contact us at sales at ISPRadio.com. Now go out there and push those packets as fast as you can. Good luck and Godspeed.